Hey there guys, this is Richard, your host, with another marvelous video. It's not surprising that the MCU's Black Panther was one of the biggest hits in their whole arsenal of superhero movies. The action and depth of characters were just insane and quite intricate. Respect to Chadwick Boseman for portraying the King of Wakanda as well as he did, and also to the makers of the film for the magnificent job of it. Marvel isn't done though, as we already have the sequel, Black Panther Wakanda Forever, releasing soon. As far as we know from the trailer and teasers, the main villain of the movie is going to be Namor, ruler of the underwater world of Tolokan. However, over the years, the Black Panther has had many adversaries. Let's take a look into the top 10 of his worst enemies. Some of them might make a small appearance in the new movie, for all we know. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Eric Killmonger Killmonger was the main antagonist in the first Black Panther movie and they represented him magnificently. In the movie, we see that he's a boy who was raised by one of the usurpers to the Wakandan throne. Clearly, that coup had failed or else we would have seen him next to the throne if not on it. So, he grew up on the hate for his uncle T'Chaka and his cousin T'Challa blaming them for killing his father Njobu and stealing his throne. Becoming an orphan, he made this hatred his weapon and vowed to reclaim Wakanda. This is quite in line with the comic origins. The only difference is that in the comics, his family was killed due to political conspiracies of overthrowing the then king of Wakanda by the seditious Mdemwe. Thing is, though the only time we see Killmonger gain superpowers in the movie is after he consumes the heart-shaped herb, he actually has a lot of different powers in the comics. Generally speaking, most of these powers are side effects of him being resurrected time and time again. Just to name a few examples, in the comics, after the war between the intergalactic empire of Wakanda and the Maroons, yes, that's a whole thing, so let us know in the comments below if you want us to make a video about that, Killmonger was taken to the resurrection altar by Zenzi and Tetu. Here, his body was bonded to the symbiote of Emperor Njadaka, and his soul came back into his now much stronger body. Next, after he consumes the heart-shaped herb, he actually goes into a coma because he isn't of royal blood. However, when he wakes up from the coma, he does in fact gain all the powers of the Black Panther. Superhuman senses being one of the more unique powers that he gains, it allows him to see even a hundred feet away clearly in absolute darkness. He can memorize thousands of different scents and trace their location like a bloodhound, and can even smell if someone is afraid or if they're lying. Stamina and combat ability-wise, he's on par with if not stronger than the Black Panther T'Challa considering they once sparred for three whole days non-stop. Having been trained in numerous forms of combat and often referred to as one of the best martial artists the Marvel Universe has ever seen, it's clear as day why Eric was such a threat to T'Challa and Wakanda. In his first appearance in Marvel Comics, Jungle Action No. 6, he actually beats T'Challa in combat even without any superpowers. This point is further proved because he does make several attempts at taking the throne from him later on and often beats him in single combat. White Wolf Way back when he was a child, Hunter's parents died in a plane crash in the African country of Mahanda, just north of the Wakandan border. Seeing this tragedy, the King T'Chaka adopted him and made him a Wakandan. However, the people of Wakanda were quite discriminatory towards him because he was white, unlike everyone else. Despite this, he still gained a love for Wakanda as his own nation and became quite patriotic, in fact. Much to his dismay, though, T'Challa was born and Hunter knew he would not be made king. So, to try and gain favor, and basically look better than T'Challa, he tried his best to become the best Wakandan possible in every sense. This is what led him to becoming the head of Wakanda's secret police, the Hatat Zaraze. From that point on, he would be known as the White Wolf. Shortly after T'Chaka was assassinated, T'Challa became king of Wakanda and disbanded the Hatat Zoraze, stating that their ways of discipline and correction were far too extreme. This didn't sit well with them, and so they went on exile, becoming world-class mercenaries. Despite the obvious tension between the two brothers, Hunter always put his love for Wakanda first and would provide his aid whenever the nation needed it. The White Wolf doesn't have any superpowers. However, he's trained in hand-to-hand -hand combat and has kept his Hatat Zoraze uniform in use. This uniform is really quite unique because it has a lot of properties that are similar to the Black Panther suit. Both being created from a vibranium micro-weave mesh, the suit has the ability to absorb momentum of pretty much all sorts. This means that if he gets shot, the bullet just stops and falls to the ground upon touching him. This also means that he can't really be stabbed at all unless you slice along the grain of the mesh uniform. The vibranium suit also houses state-of-the-art cloaking technology, allowing the White Wolf to go completely invisible. Unlike the standard-issue Hatat Zaraze suits, hunters can appear to look like a different kind of clothing including a white business suit. 
How convenient. The last part of his suit would be the shoes, and man, are they cool. His boots have some sort of energy regulator, courtesy Vibranium Tech, that enables him to withstand drops from tremendous heights, very similar to the sneakers seen in the movie. For arms, he mostly uses rifles, handguns, and other such weapons, owing to his training and access to the Hatat Zaraze. Oh yeah, and he's rich, too. There's a point in time when T'Challa leaves Wakanda and becomes the protector of Hell's Kitchen, a district in Manhattan, New York. Around this time, the White Wolf goes about killing women to draw the panther out, his objective being to kill T'Challa and become the Black Panther. T'Challa works with the NYPD to try and bring him to a stop. Finally, T'Challa and the wolf fight, with the latter being defeated. Craven, the hunter. Born Sergei Kravinov to a Russian aristocratic family in St. Petersburg, Sergei had an alcoholic father and a half-brother named Dmitri. He would get regular beatings from his father at the time and Sergei would let the same frustration out on Dmitri. Later, after the Bolshevik Revolution and their father's death, the family would emigrate to the United States. There, their mother would be put into an asylum, leaving both the brothers as orphans. Sergei would later develop arachnophobia when he visited his mother in the spider-infested asylum. Seeing his mother in such a mental tortured state was too much for him already, so when she would commit suicide in that same building, his fear of spiders would only increase. This is what started him off on his quest to survive as obsessively as he did. He and his brother would travel the world by hiding in ships and trains going across Asia and Europe. Eventually, they went their separate ways. As he became an adult, he moved to Africa, where he discovered that he has an innate talent for hunting. He would work on this, improving his skills in the wild and becoming a master hunter. This grew his fame and notoriety as a wealthy hunter. Over time, he changed his name to Craven. Expanding on his obsession for survival, he would eventually come across a local witch doctor who had created a herbal potion that would empower his senses and abilities, basically making him stronger, smell better, see better, etc., etc. He now became an even better hunter than he was before. He would move on to hunting bigger and rarer game, going as far as beginning a partnership in rare and illegal animal skin and ivory exports. Craven's reputation grew even more than before, and at one point he was even recruited by Nick Fury. Here, he was tasked with infiltrating Nazi forces and hunting down Red Skull. Craven was extremely good at hand-to-hand -hand combat, a lot of which was self-taught in order to defeat and capture his opponents. He was proficient in the use of rifles and handguns too, although he preferred more traditional weapons like spears, axes, bows and arrows. Craven was also quite experienced in taming wild animals and manipulating them even if the wild was in outer space or the savage lands. Once, Eric Killmonger gave him permission to hunt down the Black Panther and film the capture. This took place on Pele Pele Island in Avengers, Black Panther's Quest, episode T'Challa Royale. However, Craven was unsuccessful and T'Challa defeated him. You look just like your old man. Ulysses Claw Ulysses Claw was a notorious black market arms dealer. A long time ago, Killmonger's father had taken his help in stealing a big pile of vibranium from Wakanda to aid in Njobu's revolution. Years later, we see that he sold this stock of vibranium to Ultron in Avengers Age of Ultron. Although he left that exchange with one arm less, he was still determined to regain his stockpile of vibranium. Claw would get a prosthetic arm which contained a bunch of weapons in it. This was when he joined forces with Killmonger. This connection was noticed by Wakanda and he was captured by the Black Panther. Though Killmonger initially saved him, he would later kill Claw to prove his loyalty and enter Wakanda. In the comics, his origin story starts with his father, Fritz Claw, a Nazi operative. Fritz has crashed into Wakanda, trying to kill his way into stealing their precious vibranium. However, he failed in this mission. Fast forward some years, we see his son, Ulysses, growing up to be a scientist working on advanced sonic application. His work led him to realize that the technology he developed required vibranium to work. Then he pretty much did what his father did before him and tried to take Wakanda's vibranium by force when they said no to simply handing it over to him. It was in this fight that T'Challa used one of Claw's own weapons to destroy his right arm. He would return many years later, attaching his sound converter to the vibranium. This allowed him to create creatures made purely of sound to fight Black Panther and the Fantastic Four. However, this fight didn't go as planned and Claw took the executive decision of jumping into the sound converter, turning him into a being of purely solid sound. Stan Lee was one of the original creators of Ulysses Claw. Over the years in the comics, we see Claw try to beat Black Panther many times for many reasons, mostly revenge, because he couldn't get the vibranium he wanted so badly and also because, well, he's a sore loser. Man-Ape, a.k.a. M'Baku. This is one legend of a super character. 
Born and raised in the Jabari village of Wakanda, M'Baku was one of the greatest warriors the country had ever seen. The only one being above him would be T'Challa, the Black Panther. As we know from the movies, Wakanda is a nation with technology far more advanced than any other on the planet. However, they, much like other African countries, initially started as a primitive culture. M'Baku happened to be one of those regressive types. At a time when the panther cult was dominant, the Black Panther had outlawed the white gorilla cult. So, when T'Challa had left Wakanda for America to help the Avengers on some mission, M'Baku decided to revive his old cult. The man literally found a very rare white gorilla near the jungles of Wakanda, killed it, ate its flesh and bathed in its blood, and somehow doing so imbibed M'Baku with its tremendous strength. Later, when the Black Panther would return to Wakanda, M'Baku, now calling himself the Man-Ape, would challenge his right to rule. This would lead them to fight, M'Baku fighting to restore Wakanda to its primitive ways and T'Challa fighting to defend its current values and culture, and yes, its technology. The Man-Ape would eventually win this battle, tying T'Challa to a giant statue of a panther. However, in his attempt to crush the king with the statue, it crumbles down upon him, burying him underneath. Believing that he died under the rubble, Black Panther returns to America to join the Avengers. Of course, that wasn't the end for M'Baku as he was revived by his closest follower, N'Gamo. The Man-Ape then followed T'Challa to America. There, he teamed up with the Grim Reaper and a few others and managed to kidnap the Panther's girlfriend in order to draw him into a trap. But the rest of the Avengers showed up soon enough and rescued T'Challa. The Man-Ape was defeated after fighting Captain America and was henceforth banned from returning to Wakanda ever again. T'Challa made sure of this by announcing that he would be given the death penalty if he did. Doctor Doom Victor Von Doom came from a small country in Europe called Latveria. When he was a child, his mother, a sorceress, tried to strike a bargain with the demon Mephisto for power. However, this deal went awry and his mother, Cynthia, was killed. In her dying moments, she left Victor with his father and asked him to protect their son from the demon. At the time, Victor's dad was a doctor and got called into the royal palace to treat the Latvarian queen. Realizing that he could not save her, he tried to run away with his son. This didn't get him very far as he died soon after and left Victor with his best friend, Boris. Over time, Victor managed to come across several books on magic and sorcery that belonged to his mother. Being a smart kid, this is where he began learning and teaching himself the art of magic, his main driving force being saving his mother's soul from the grips of the demon Mephisto. Later on in life, Victor actually became a really bright scholar, getting into Empire State University with a scholarship. Eventually, he tried to create an invention that could potentially bring his mother back to him. However, it seemed that he had made an error in his calculations and the device exploded in his face, getting his face permanently scarred and being resuscitated from the university. Victor traveled to Tibet. There, he found a group of monks and began learning their ways. With his intellect, he quickly managed to get to the top of the order and asked them to make him a suit of armor. Probably due to everything he had experienced before, Victor was so intrigued by the armor that he put on the metal faceplate while it was still red hot, scarring his face even more. This is when he became Doctor Doom. His first act as Doctor Doom was to kill Baron Vladimir, the one who was responsible for his father's death. Beyond this, he's mainly known as the arch enemy of Reed Richards, aka Mr. Fantastic. One time, Doom got a hold of all of Wakanda's vibranium after finding out that the metal could be magically charged with the potential for limitless power. As he began working to enrich the vibranium with magic, he would be able to make it come to life, allowing him to wage war across the planet in his conquest of global domination. Here, the Black Panther and Shuri got all their allies together at the Latverian border. Doom took his invitation to destroy all his enemies once and for all, and he was almost successful too. However, the Black Panther managed to use Doom's power to render all the Wakandan vibranium to be completely useless, thereby ending the war across the world and defeating Doom. Zenzi this one is a bit tricky, mainly because her first appearance was in 2016, so there isn't that much lore about her and none whatsoever regarding her origins. Zenzi is a Nigandan woman with the ability to manipulate and bring forth very deep and strong emotions in the people around her. This classifies her as a mutant by birth. In her first appearance, she's faced with Killmonger soldiers who intend to kill her near a massive graveyard. In this instance, we see her use her powers to control their emotions, bending them to her will leading to the soldiers killing each other. Later, she became the leader of the Nagandan army and became allies with Tetu. Tetu was the head of a Wakandan revolutionary force called the People. This friendship made sense because of Zenzi's powers and authority, as we would then see her manipulate Wakandans into starting riots within the city. 
There were two particular instances where Zenzi met the Black Panther. The first time, near the Nagandan border, Zenzi managed to use her powers on him and render him incapacitated. However, the second time, the Black Panther was better prepared. This time, he, along with his Hatut Zaraze, laid an ambush for Zenzi, Tetu, and some other Nagandan soldiers. Here, the Black Panther knocks her straight into a coma before she can use her powers. This wasn't the end of her, as Tetu managed to save her and wake her up several days later. In a broad sense, Zenzi is able to read and manipulate other people's emotions. She has the ability to remove all emotional walls, exposing their deepest, truest selves and bringing them to the fore. The soldiers of the people under her control can march day and night without stopping, because she can use her abilities to turn off the limiters in one's brain, allowing them to breach the physical limits of the human body. In the same way, Zenzi's powers have the potential to turn people into mindless beasts with increased strength, speed and durability. Masters of Evil The Masters of Evil are a group of villains that have mainly been set opposite the Avengers. Over the decades since their first appearance way back in 1964, there have been numerous iterations of this league. They've had over 50 different members over this time, including Manape and Claw. However, the iteration we will talk about is the one created by Baron Helmut Zemo. So, way back during World War II, Baron Heinrich Zemo was responsible for the demise of Captain America. But the captain managed to return, much to Heinrich's displeasure. Heinrich, wanting to end him again once and for all, created the first Masters of Evil ever. Baron Helmut Zemo inherited this hatred for Captain America. However, unlike his father before him, Zemo created a bigger team filled only with superhuman villains, bigger even than the Avengers roster. He did this to make sure that he would finally win against the Avengers and properly beat Captain America. Funny story is that one of the few times Black Panther meets this version of the Masters is when evil Captain America, from an alternate reality, is attempting to take control of the United States. Here we see him working with Hydra to trap as many superheroes as they can in a Dark Force dome in Manhattan. This allowed Hydra to storm Washington, D.C. and take over the country. However, Hydra was afraid of what the Masters of Evil could do if they were allowed to roam free, so they put them in a stasis kind of state. Soon enough, a revolution began to overthrow Hydra from Washington. At this point, Hydra ordered Zemo to awaken the Masters, so they could turn the tables and win the fight. Nevertheless, the Black Panther and the Winter Soldier would stop him. The Hydra regime would fall and the Masters were either forced to leave or arrested by the police. This was just one of the stories behind the Masters of Evil, and over the years, the Black Panther has met them head-on in a battle many times as a member of the Avengers. King Kadava oh. King Kadava is one of those types of characters that have had so much potential but was left mostly unexplored. First appearing in Jungle Action Volume 2 way back in 1974, he was shown as a horrific abomination of a villain. He had the ability to cause pain using psychic forces, conjure up vivid hallucinations, and even control people's minds. However, that was pretty much the only time we ever got to see him at all, because he only appeared in four issues. The only fair bit of lore we have about him is that he was one of Killmonger's most loyal henchmen. Also, unlike every other villain to oppose the Black Panther, this one was one of the few that even managed to scare him. This changed just a few years ago, because in 2019 we actually saw him return, although for a very brief duration, in an alternate reality, which hasn't been given an official name yet. In this reality, he would go to Wakanda under the disguise of Mr. Mchezaji. Here, he became Wakanda's chief of mining and managed to increase the production of vibranium by four times what it used to be. Obviously, there had to be a catch to such a sudden and massive boost to production in the most technologically advanced nation on the planet. Thing is, he was using some sort of proton excavating tools and machines that ended up causing earthquakes and other natural disasters all across the country. Once he was exposed as the one who caused all of this, he took Queen Mother Ramonda as his hostage. Probably a bad move because the Black Panther came in and freed her while defeating him. King Kadava did, however, manage to escape. Namor Making his first appearance way back in 1939, Namor's origin kind of reminds us of the Little Mermaid. So, Winston Churchill dispatched Ernest Shackleton to search for vibranium in the Antarctic in 1915. The Endurance, his ship, was never found, as if there was some Bermuda Triangle there. Later on, Paul Destine, a telepath, and Leonard Mackenzie made an effort to find the vibranium. Princess Fenn's father, Emperor Thakor of Atlantis, sent her out to look into a sudden barrage of explosions close to the surface. This was when Mackenzie met Princess Fenn, fell in love with her, and she became pregnant with Namor. The crew and Mackenzie were ambushed by Atlantean soldiers who had arrived to retrieve Fenn. After the attack, 
Fenn believed Leonard Mackenzie was dead and she returned to Atlantis pregnant with his child. The baby's name, Namor, means avenging son. Throughout his childhood, Namor teased his cousin Dorma, played with his other cousins Namora and Bira, and hung out with his pal Merano. There have been many times over the years that Namor and the Black Panther have fought, mainly due to their countries being, well, not so nice to each other. Namor is the king of Atlantis in Marvel and has power enough to stand up to the Black Panther. He's basically the Marvel counterpart of Aquaman from DC. Breathing underwater, controlling water, super strength, speed and all that are his staple powers. One interestingly differing fact is that Namor can also fly. Identical to the Greek god Hermes, Namor has wings on his ankles that allow him to maneuver fluidly between water and the air. If we talk about what we know from the trailer to Wakanda Forever, the first thing is that the MCU doesn't call his home Atlantis, instead referring to it as Talokan. This was most probably done to differentiate the two sea rulers between DC and the MCU. Interestingly, they did a really good job of providing a backstory to the name as well. If you look at the trailer, the people of Talokan are all dressed in very Aztec-esque clothing. This makes a lot of sense because Talokan is an actual place in Aztec mythology which is ruled over by their rain god. Only people who have passed due to drowning or lightning can come to this afterlife paradise. So, all in all, good job Marvel! The one other thing was the portrayal of his powers. The example we're referring to is how Namor causes a massive flood in Wakanda. If you've watched the last Black Panther movie, then you know the scale of that country. Now, of course, we don't know if Namor himself caused that entire flood or if it was done as part of his plan. But it is a safe assumption to make for such a powerful ruler. And that's it. That's a wrap on the top 10 Black Panther villains. So, now you know that there is actually so much more to the Black Panther and his list of enemies than what the MCU has shown us. The character was created so many years ago, but has remained a fan favorite among us. Comic nerds, forever. Some of these villains have decades of history, while others definitely have the potential to gain the same. That's all for this video, and thanks again for watching. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one, and be safe. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.